I'll get Louise and Raymond to talk a little bit about their experience. So, Louise, can you give us a, a bit of a snapshot of your work at Philanthropy Australia? What does it do? Sure. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, so, Philanthropy Australia is a, a membership-based pig body, a non-profit organisation, independent of government. Um, it was set up 40 years ago out of Melbourne by some of the big philanthropic uh, foundations. And we're very much a, a go-to organisation for any business or individual or family that wants to get more serious about their philanthropy. So they, they typically want to get more structured and strategic, um, I suppose more professional and sophisticated about giving their money away. So trying to move away from that sort of ad hoc giving that often happens towards the end of financial year. So we have uh, 800 members, um, and the bulk of those are family or private foundations. Uh, we have about 100 corporate members, um, and then the, the, the most of the rest are individual donors or philanthropists. Um, and we have a couple of hundred non-profits in there as well. They tend to be the, the larger non-profits that are in the major gift fundraising space or are aspiring to. So we do a lot of policy and advocacy work with government. So we might lobby government about a, a tax change that we want to see happen, or we might help a member that might fund in a particular cause area and they want to work with government or lobby government about something. It could be around disability or environment or whatever. Uh, we run a lot of professional development education programs, um, like most peak bodies, um, I suppose, to help people do what they do better. And we do a lot of connecting so, you know, if someone does fund in a cause area like um, medical research and health, well, we might help them link up with others that um, do similar things. Because one thing you, when you talk to philanthropists, one thing they say is, you know, there's so many great causes out there, but we can't fund everything. Mm -hmm. So if we can help bring some of those people together to fund. And it's fantastic because um, we were able to open an office um, in Adelaide two years ago when I uh, came on board as the CEO. And I said to the board beforehand, Seriously, I'm not interested in taking the role unless I can take the organisation primarily out of Melbourne, which, as Simon said before, had been the case. So we actually opened an office uh, here uh, with some support from the uh, James and Diana Ramsey Foundation to seed fund it initially, and also in Brisbane. And we, we really um, beef things up in Sydney as well. Mm. Fantastic. So tell me, what's the difference between making donations, um, volunteering and philanthropy? Is there, uh, uh, is there a difference between those things? Well, I mean, they're all, they're all parts of giving or philanthropy. I mean, part of me doesn't like the word philanthropy as well because it can often be seen um, or perceived as very high-end and very elitist. Mm -hmm. um, and I sometimes use the word giving as well. But, you know, I mean, one of the things we're looking for is more Australians to be to be regular givers, so to actually be giving on a regular basis, whether it's out of your pay or every month or whatever. But, you know, what's exciting is when a donor or a philanthropist becomes an engaged philanthropist. So what happens is they're not actually just giving money. So, you know, it's not just about the money. I mean, some of the most powerful things that happen to help the community sector are, are time and expertise. And, and that could be being on a non-profit board. I mean, one of the key messages today is that, you know, so many times we come across business people who um, are not on non-profit boards, and they could be, and often the response is, Louise, I just wouldn't have thought that people would see what I have to offer as any value, and you'd be amazed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking to a group of financial planners last night, and they said, oh, we're just not doing... And I said, well, actually, you know, that's what a non-profit board needs, is, you know, is, is financial skills. It's almost like a no-brainer. Yeah. But um, I think the... Sometimes it can start with the giving of time and then someone will discover the joy of giving. You know, the light bulb goes on, but often some donors don't discover that joy of giving and maybe the non-profit is not building the relationship as well as what they should. Mm. Um, so sometimes that doesn't happen, unfortunately, but it should lead to, to, to the donating of cash as well. And hopefully over time that builds and becomes more regular and they bring in their network of of contacts as well to help that non mm. So they all fall under that umbrella. Really. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Raymond, tell me about your involvement in philanthropy. How did you get started? Uh, well, I, I, I guess I have approached uh, philanthropy from the two perspectives. Um, I became first exposed to uh, philanthropy in the first 20 years of my adult life when I was uh, 
worked with a global community development organization and lived in India doing village development work for seven years and had to support that and so went around asking lots of Indian business people and business companies to get involved in village development. And then I later went back to their headquarters and uh, ended up actually running the fundraising operation of this global nonprofit organization. But I think the real teacher for me of philanthropy was a wonderful woman that I had the pleasure of meeting by the name of Reddy Thomas. Uh, when I met her, she was probably in her mid-60s, but uh, she had grown up very wealthy. Her husband uh, was the founder and chairman of a public company. And he retired at 65, and they gave each of their kids a million bucks and said, that's it, we're going to spend the rest and have fun doing it and give it away. Unfortunately, her husband then died. So she spent 30 years giving it away. But not just giving it away, becoming phenomenally involved. Uh, she and I raised a lot of money together, but she was hands-on involved in many different organizations. And I think she really taught me that, I guess, you know, and it's interesting, the meaning of philanthropy is something like, you know, love of humanity, or, uh, you know, in the sense of caring, nourishing, developing, nurturing, enhancing what it means to be human. And uh, so she really taught me, I think, the most basic thing about philanthropy, that it's a lot more than giving money. Uh, it is truly a deep connection between you, the giver, if you, that's what you're doing, or the volunteer or whatever, and the piece of humanity, that, whether it's a village in India or something else that you're serving. Uh, later, when uh, Tina and I left that organization and we ended up setting up a business and so on, we found ourselves on the other side of it. And being in America, you just can't avoid it. And you, I mean, I'm not saying I wanted to avoid it, but you can't. Uh, and so we found ourselves thinking about what it, what it means to be involved philanthropically. And I guess the causes that tended to attract us were the ones that we were involved in. So that it wasn't just money, but it was also time and maybe some brain power or whatever. And I think probably because we'd both been in the nonprofit world and, and it wasn't you know, a highly recognized one like Red Cross or something, We'd had to struggle for funds that we tend to give a lot of money to more entrepreneurial and startup kind of organizations. At, uh, you know, uh, the money we give, I don't mean to imply we give a lot of money, but, uh, but we tend to focus it on really the stuff that people don't fund. So, you know, the fundraising costs or the, the core operating costs because that's the hard part of the money to raise. So, you know, coming back here obviously with the the SAMRI and other organizations, and, and uh, now Impact 100, I mean, I think there's plenty of opportunities for people to be engaged. Mm -hmm. You raised um, the US, and, and there is a, a, you know, very much a culture of philanthropy in the US, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, do we need a culture of philanthropy in Australia? I mean, there's a lot more focus here, isn't there, on government will provide these things. Um, Mm. Why is it important, do you think, any of you, um, why do you think it's important to have a culture, a culture of philanthropy in Australia? Well, look, I'll start off mm -hmm. by taking on from where Raymond just left off, namely that um, let's start by thinking about the givers. Let's do the givers, um, let's give them a hand by opening their eyes, our eyes, for what you actually get back from giving. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the, the giving back thing seems to me, I almost find it tacky to talk about, but the reality is that, um, Nikki, I don't see many saints around. Uh, I know, I think in my life, of my little circles, I probably can think of three or four people who constantly amaze me. They have no interest in their self. They are saints. But most of the people I mix with are like me. We're human beings, and I need nurturing. I need something. I need whatever it is, and well, I think I need it. And all I'm saying is that I think um, the whole issue of um, giving uh, starts with me about not the recipient, but what it does mm. to the giver. And um, the one thing I will just simply say is that in the US, the reality is that there are too many dinner parties where um, all aspects of the US society, but particularly mm. the top end, 
just naturally talk about what they're getting from their giving. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's like how we talk about the footy. Mm. Um, whereas here in Australia, I think we do it in pockets, you know. It's, yeah. and, and to go back to what you said, it would just be wonderful, I think, if culturally we got over it mm. and said, um, this is a legitimate thing to talk about. You know, we need more than a weekly pay packet to sustain us. Let's talk about um, what one gets mm-hmm. in all its guises from giving. Mm. Right, yeah, so. no, I, yeah, I abs- absolutely agree. I think, I mean, it is true compared to the US, I guess you could say we don't have a deep tradition and culture of philanthropy, but, uh, but our giving is at a similar level in Australia to many, you know, many other developed countries, mm-hmm. less as a percentage of GDP than the US, which is 1% of GDP, and here it's 0.3%, but it's mm. quite, it's not. Mm. And much of our giving goes to either religious causes or humanitarian causes that, you know, like crises such as bushfires mm. or tsunamis and, and things like that. Mm. Whereas a lot of the uh, focus on giving in the US is more around what you might, in addition to those kind of things, is around what you might call sort of future building mm. thing, you know, mm. that trying to put in place in the social infrastructure, the missing elements. Mm. Um, but it's very long and deep. I mean, it goes back to some, you know, Andrew, uh, Carnegie, who wrote, uh, you know, the Gospel of Wealth, in which he said straight up, "Look, the, the biggest disgrace that can happen to a man is to die rich. You should give it away." And that's, you know, that mentality has been uh, fostered and encouraged, and so on, uh, and has inspired literally generations of people. Uh, I, I don't think it hurts either that the U.S. has a death tax, and so people are forced to think about the transition of their estate very, very early. Mm. It's mm. not something you put off until you retire and are three years away from the statistical age of death. I mean, mm. people plan, the estate planning process is very complex and as part of that, you tend to structure the giving patterns and, mm. uh, and so on. So, I, you know, I think that we, I think probably too in Australia, frankly, cultural attitudes to wealth are different than the US. And I think, uh, you know, we have a considerable emphasis on, you know, equality and charity at some level, I think is, is kind of seen as a bit colonial, you know, sort of with overtones of, I don't know, where benevolence kind of often is met with cynicism. So you think that gets in the way of- I do. Yeah, so what, yeah. what could we do about that? We need people to talk about it more, don't we? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Uh, I, I absolutely think so. I, I think that we, I, I, but it's, it's not easy in this cultural context. Mm. No. It, it, as uh, Simon said, in the American context, where someone is saying at a dinner party, yeah, well, you know, we got involved with this and we gave him that, and, you know, it, it doesn't come across as, well, he's just trying, yes. or she's just trying to, you know, brag about this or be one up on that. It's, it's, it's just, just sort of a natural thing. Mm. Mm. So I think we do have to find a way to tell, get those stories told more. Uh, I, I know uh, Wendy Scaife, who's in, in the Queensland Institute of Technology, has done, done a study and you know, she says probably a lot of Australians give without talking about it and so on. But then you get people like Dick Smith who say, well, that's absolutely a pile of crap. In fact, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, people aren't giving quietly. They're just not giving at all. <laughs> so, you know, there's probably a bit of truth both, both ways there. Uh, but, but I think we do have to find kind of a way of, of uh, talking about it that's acceptable, if you like, yeah. within our social context. Yeah. And that's not easy. Yeah. But, but we do have to have people have the courage to stand up and do that. And, and people are starting to do that more. Yeah. Louise? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm actually quite optimistic, actually. I mean, you know, there are some, some you know, terrible figures like 38% of Australians who earn more than a million dollars a year do not actually claim a tax deductible receipt for anything. Now, some people say to me, well, they could still, still be giving um, and they're not claiming the receipt, but, you know, for my money, the wealthier the person the more likely they are to want to minimise their tax. So that sort of figure keeps me awake at night. But I think there's two things that make me um, quite optimistic. The first one is younger generations. I mean, yep. um, when, we, when I came into the organisation two years ago, we started a, a young donor 
uh, program. It's called the New Generation of Giving. And it's for high capacity donors between the ages of 20 and 40. Mm -hmm. And it's about training up the future leaders mm -hmm. in philanthropy and giving. And we have 200 members nationally. Um, and it is literally growing by the week. Um, we have, I think, about 15 members in Adelaide. Now, it, it, you know, and that, that will grow here as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a hands-on program. Um, they want to get their hands dirty now. They're not, they're not sitting around thinking about when am I going to set up a foundation? Yeah. Um, you know, we have a board placement program. We've actually placed 30 of them actually on non-profit boards. 20 mm. of them went off on a study tour to Silicon Valley mm. last year to meet with Gates and whatever else. Um, you know, but, but you know, that's where I'm optimistic mm. because I actually think that generation, particularly yeah, the better agreed. educated ones, if you, yeah. if you think about professional service firms now, I was just talking to Rick, you know, when they employ graduates, I can remember when I was a lawyer and I was being being employed, all I was interested in is how much are you going to pay me, where's my office going to be, can I have a year off and what date am I going to start? Well, now in the banks and the law firms and the accounting firms, you know, number three or four question is, well, what actually are you guys doing in the community? Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about that, that's pretty exciting that that's happening and that's why I'm optimistic. I think the second thing that's really changing in Australia in the last couple of years is the media profile. Um, I have been uh, pretty excited about the media interest in philanthropy and giving. Now, I must admit, we have, we are starting to see what I call mega Ooh. gifts happening in Australia. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Westpac establishing the Westpac Bicentennial Foundation, 100 million, the Packers and Crown Resorts were 200, mm -hmm. Forest was 65, a couple of $50 million, yeah. you know, we've had a good run mm -hmm. of big gifts. Yeah. But now mainstream media is really taking it seriously mm. and they're coming to us for stories. I mean, we were approached by Q&A the other day to say, look, you know, we know you've got something one coming out next week from the States, can we put them on? Mm. Um, but, uh, and, and they're not cynical, they're not as cynical as what I think they used right. to be five right. years ago. So that's pretty exciting because what they want is the stories. Mm. What we want is the stories told as mm. well because that encourages other people out there that are watching or reading think, well, actually, you know, maybe I could do something like that. That mightn't be my cause area of interest, but maybe I could do it in, yeah. in another area. Yeah. So, and it's encouraging people to think bigger yeah. about their giving as well, because I think mm, Australians I were, you know, traditionally pretty small in their ideas around mm, philanthropy. Mm. So, Louise, what difference do you think the state, does the state of the economy have on philanthropy? Do you see, have you seen any trends in that regard? Look, there, there's no question it has some impact, but you know, it was interesting before that uh, GFC hit, a lot of people said to me, ooh, because I was working in the arts at the time, they said to me, um, you know, I really think the arts is going to be hit really badly here, you better watch out. But you know, the GFC wasn't really that, that negatively impacted here compared mm -hmm. to other parts of the world. So exactly. we didn't really have much of a dip at all from mm. what I could see, because I think it actually made non-profits work harder mm. to actually keep their existing donors. And maybe they weren't, maybe in that GFC, they, they may not have attracted quite as many new donors, but they would have kept them warm. And hopefully, you know, they've come on board since then. But um, I think sometimes we can use that as an excuse. And I think it's probably a bit of a poor excuse. Mm, okay. Simon, you talked about shareholders often not being keen, you know, having to answer to shareholders and that's why business doesn't get as involved perhaps as it, as it otherwise could. Um, what could we do about, about getting more businesses involved? And I guess there's some, you, you know, gave a few examples. Are there other examples that you can give? Um, Nikki, I had 20 minutes to talk and <laughs> I tried to just confine myself to uh, what I call widely held businesses, you know, listed mm. companies or subsidiaries of foreign companies. Um, look, I'm the first to acknowledge that when we talk about business, of course, that also encompasses SMEs yeah. and other privately held, you know, larger organisations. And if you really want to get me going, that's where I get extraordinarily excited because the prospect of actually a family or an individual owning a business, it's going to have to stand on its own two feet, compete vigorously, constantly improve, etc., etc. But actually also, uh, that family or the owner having, you know, some liberated thoughts as to where the profits might go or whatever. I mean, that really, really, really gets me interested. But um, coming back to your point, um, look, at the end of the day, the, you know, the institutional setup of 
um, our corporate, you know, of our larger corporations. I'm happy to be shouted down, but you know, honestly, that's not going to change anytime mm. soon, and it actually shouldn't. I mean, the reality is that the typical institution will be holding, um, you know, its interest in a company on behalf of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of of indi individual investors. And ultimately, what we are talking about today is individual choice. You know, that's why so much of what I talked about before was about the relationship, not just the act of giving, mm -hmm. but trying to engender the strongest possible two-way relationship. Because when we get that right, yeah. mm. individuals just take over. And um, you know, all I would say is that, yeah, look, I come from Victoria. We are sharing similar pain to what's going on here. We have four or five large-scale employers, three vehicle manufacturers, a major uh, aluminium industry participant in Geelong, and it's awful just knowing their three-year wind-down strategy. You know, you can just see the unemployment numbers there. And, and I'm, as a Melbourneian, very attuned to the idea how is the charitable sector going to suffer from that. Mm. But I've got to say those thoughts are outweighed by the positivity of the experience. I mean, the last thing we want to do is bankrupt our families because we give all our money away. But what I am saying is that the, those wonderful feelings from getting it right in philanthropy can be up there with going along and watching Essendon beat the crows or you know whatever turns you on and that's what we've got to get, that's what we've got to get better at as a nation that that's what I think me on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Raymond, well no I, I think too sort of g going back a little bit and recircling I, I don't believe we have to wait uh, in, in terms of creating an environment that encourages uh, you know this love of humanity through <laughs> The giving uh, for the ultra wealthy to be the only ones setting the example, and yeah. I mean, I mean, it's why I, I think that that what Jeff's done here in terms of Impact 100 is such a great thing because uh, you know this is a relatively simple concept in the mm. sense of finding a hundred people to give a thousand dollars. Now, a thousand dollars is a lot of money. I mean, it's two and a half times the average donating amount, right? Mm. But for young professionals and people who uh, it, you know, it's kind of, it's in sort of the right level, I guess, between being serious, pinching a bit, because you don't give $1,000 if you're on a, you know, a salary, even a young professional salary easily, and, but relevance, and, and creating that camaraderie mm. that, you know, the 100, mm. and I think it now is 150, uh, I think is, it, you know, it's, a, and doing, focusing it on a charity where, in fact, you make kind of a life-changing difference to that yes. charity, and, yeah. and therefore they all own that, as it were, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I, I think is, is phenomenal. Uh, and I think what you, you know, philanthropy is like most things in life. Small steps are the best way to begin. Mm -hmm. And once you get into the habit of giving, uh, th then I think, uh, you know, you create a lifelong habit. Yeah. And, and yeah. So we won't change the culture around philanthropy in Australia overnight, but I think kind of this pincer movement, as it were, with some of the really, uh, you know, mega gifts that are starting to be given, and then uh, things like Impact 100. Yeah. Yeah. You know, over a 10-year period can have a very profound impact, I think. Yeah, I think uh, the thing I love about Impact 100 is that the members get involved in the decision-making around who the, the, the contribution goes to as well. Yeah. So it's not just handing over your money, it's, you know, getting a two-way return, as you talked about, Simon. Mm -hmm. And on that um, um, idea about the, the, the two-way return, there are a lot of people from charities here today. So I want to ask your opinion about how organisations, charities, um, could do better at attracting philanthropic funds. Um, I know you've got, you've got some thoughts on that, Raymond. Do you want to kick off? Uh, yeah, I may not end up as the friend of many of them with my thoughts, but, uh, um, you know, I think the fact of the matter is many, you know, smaller and middle scale uh, non-profit organisations in Australia just don't devote the resources to fundraising that you have to devote and are kind of, in a sense, too risk averse um, uh, to consider investing in the staff that you need for, to work for a year or two to start the process up. It's not, you know, it's not easy. Mm. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen easily. And I think even by world standards, and certainly by American standards, uh, Australia's even largest nonprofit organizations tend to have 
a relatively small investment in fundraising compared to, to, uh, to those. So it does take nonprofit boards and leadership quite a bit of courage to show the way and you know, really be leaders in both getting and uh, you know, giving funds and you know, making sure that the organization invests in the appropriate staff support and structures and so on to build it. One of, the, one of the problems, though, is that they get wrapped over the knuckles um, for the cost of fundraising. And I, I thought it was great that you said that you, that's where you often put your money uh, into, into yeah. charities because, uh, because that's, such a, you know, that's such a big media interest in the cost of fundraising. I think that's probably something charities are quite sensitive about. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, uh, if, if uh, a charity can say that its fundraising costs have been covered by you know, the board or... Yeah. You know another donor, and therefore we've got, you know that's that's taken care of. So your funds don't have to do that, uh, but your funds can go to whatever it is yeah. you know the specific yeah. uh, thing that they're they're doing. But 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 it also requires to to raise significant money. Charities have really got to have a phenomenal case, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, I, I think uh, you know people give to causes that touch them emotionally and closely and and to which they can identify and be engaged with in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, that's why, obviously, humanitarian organizations do so well after a tragedy. I mean, people, you know, everybody in South Australia identified with the victims of the fires in Victoria. They were our fires. Yeah. And, and uh, um, uh, so I think that it's not just investing in people, but it is really, I, I think there's wonderful roles, for example, for marketing and companies and so on to get involved with charities and to do pro, pro bono work to help them tell their story. Because often the charities are the worst people at telling their own story. <laughs> they either leave the light under the bushel dynamic or they're so, they get so wound up in the details that they don't get the story. And, and having, a really, uh, having a really strong case uh, uh, for your fundraising effort is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah. I saw your, you nodding, Simon. Did you want to add? Oh, yeah, you just reminded me of something I didn't mention when I was up there. But uh, Raymond, you're absolutely spot on. Sometimes the the infrastructure inside an organisation, whether it's a marketing department that you just mentioned, a finance department, you know, this stuff is there for the use of the corporation 365 days a year. And the reality is that some of these Organ uh, some of these parts of the business are busier some parts of the year than others. It's just the mm. way it is. Mm. And uh, exactly. gosh, when you get fabulously uh, skilled people in these organisations then putting um, those skills to work in the non-for-profit sector, um, you know, obviously it's terrific. For me, the secret is the connectors. The secret is those people in the corporation itself that actually have the wherewithal to think how can this be put to good use? And in particular, coming back to the uh, non-for-profit sector, equally adept people who understand that mind of the corporate, that was the point I was trying to make before, who then can connect with their counterparts so well. It's the connecting I often see not happening. Mm. Um, you know, you can see the skill, you can see the need, but the road that connects the two mm. um, is where we struggle. And, and I'm certainly with, uh, uh, with Raymond that, um, it's funny, I used to sit on the board of a very large charity and every month or whatever the, the results would, the, the financials would come out, particularly the expense to income ratio. Obviously, that's mm. the one mm. all Australians focus on. And it was, it was great because they had a little green spot, you know, where they felt was right. And if it was a bit more than that, you know, it went orange and then finally, you know, it was red. But interestingly, it was reciprocated down, namely, if they weren't spending enough, mm. it got orange and it got red, you know, down at 6% or something like that. Mm. They'd made their own view that, uh, you know, if that's where you're going to be permanently, you're going to yep. see the, um, yep. you know, the, the sliding away of this organisation. And, uh, and, and I'm with Raymond. I think it's important to sometimes stand up to the community and say, look, if you want us to be good, it's actually going to cost something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, I'm giving you a, a two-minute warning. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to hand over to you. So please do get your questions ready. Louise, one for you. Um, because I asked both Raymond and Simon about this, and they said, no, no, that's one for Louise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I want to ask you about the growth in crowdfunding, and, okay. and tell us about that. What happens there? 
Well, I mean, it, it is, I think it's a very untapped potential. And one of the interesting things about crowdfunding is that it's not just about how much money you raise, the cash, but if you do it well, you can actually build a really loyal following yeah. or audience, you know, if you happen to be in the creative arts field as well. Some but people might not even know yeah. what it is. So. so what it is, is actually raising money for a project, typically, as opposed to operating costs, typically, mm -hmm. through using an online platform. So if you Google um, Kickstarter, um, Indiegogo, Pozible, P-O-Z-I-B-L-E, they're all platforms and there's plenty of others mm -hmm. uh, as well. And you can, you can actually post a, a project on that platform and then you actually use social media to actually drive traffic to that site and get people to make a gift. And typically, it's about large volumes of people mm -hmm actually giving small amounts of money, and you can actually offer rewards in return mm. um, for people gifting. And there's typically no tax deductibility, although there are some sites now that offer tax deductibility, which is quite good because you can either take the rewards or not. But we had um, the composer, singer, Kate miller Heidke, who some of you may be aware of, come and talk to us recently. And she, she left her music company and was about to release a new CD and decided to do a crowdfunding campaign. Now, she actually raised $180,000 in three days. Wow. Now, obviously, she's got a huge following because she's a <laughs> musician, but she did cute little things like if you gave $500, she would ring you up on your mobile and sing happy birthday. <laughs> if you gave five grand, she'd come to your home and do a private performance. So, you know, it, it, you can have a bit of fun. The trouble with it is that... Um, there's a lot of people doing them that are not doing them well. There's only about a 50% success rate. Um, so there is a bit of a, an art in doing it well, but if you do do it well, it can be extremely powerful. What we're not seeing in Australia yet is matched funding for successful crowdfunding campaigns. There's only been a couple of examples, but in the States, you could have a philanthropist or a foundation or a group that actually match fund a successful crowdfunding campaign. That could be a documentary filmmaker raising money. So that's quite exciting because it brings the sort of high-end philanthropy mm. into sort of meet mass giving, which I particularly like. But as a great example in the corporate sector, it's the only one that I know of yet where ING, the online uh, bank, if you think about they, they of course have a lot of younger customers because they're an online bank, but they're now running some crowdfunding campaigns for uh, customers and staff. And they ran a pilot last year, it was very successful, and they're doing it again yeah. this year as well. So it's, it's sort of a, you know, quite a, quite a different way. We're talking about staff, you know, customer engagement and, and the whole corp corporate space. We've now got an example that's happening uh, with crowdfunding. So I think there's a lot more potential there. But, you know, one, one challenge I'd throw out to the audience, we're talking about giving circles and, and the success of Impact 100 South Australia here. We haven't actually seen a business or corporate in Australia yet actually do a giving circle themselves. So you could actually see an equivalent of Impact 100 in a corporate. Mm. And we actually talked to a big one this morning yeah. about the idea of actually setting one here. So we're talking about the staff coming together, pooling a donation of, it could be 100 bucks each or 200 or whatever it is. They then choose a cause area for that year and they all have, and, and you know, submissions come in, they vote. And they could also have a lot of fun with that yeah, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it could be, you know, a first in South Australia to have a corporate actually doing um, a giving circle. And it doesn't have to be 100. No. It could be 1,000, but it could be 50 or 20. You know, it can just be as relevant with SMEs as it is mm -hmm. to the big end of town. So there's an opportunity, and we'd certainly profile it in the media. Fantastic. If, uh, if Fantastic. someone did it. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Sounds like um, on the um, crowdfunding that... Kate miller Heike is going to be very busy delivering on all those promises, <laughs> having raised that much money. Over to you. So, who would like to ask a question? We've got several hands up. Are we getting a microphone around? Yes, Hamilton's running around with a microphone. So, oh, thanks. Uh, Tim Vassadeva from RSPCA South Australia. I just wanted to pick up on something that Raymond had mentioned, which was, I guess, the propensity or the perceived propensity of individuals at the higher end to perhaps give to a specific project or initiative within a not-for-profit as opposed to broader operating costs, which you mentioned you've got an interest in. Uh, and I know in our case, you know, we took in 10,500 animals last year, which was 2,000 more than the year before, but we, we made the conscious decision that, that we needed to be that safety net and provide that care and 
you know, if they've been hit by a car, we have to do the veterinary work. If they haven't, we have to get them to sex and rehomed and, and provide that care. But that's resulted in us running a deficit of over a million dollars last year. So our, our problem is quite broad and it's across everything that we do. And I guess our tendency or, or my expectation has been that we perhaps stand a better chance at the higher end of propensity to give to pitch a specific initiative, whether it's the veterinary hospital or perhaps our rescue officers or our inspectors or whatever it is. But do you see scope then for, for within that higher end, for some people to be looking at it the way that you do, um, to be looking at potentially funding broad operating costs because an organisation does this much work, it's not just so isolated? Y yes, I think so. I mean, particularly um, mature donors. So, you know, donors who know the organisation, who maybe have given you know, three or four or five years in a row who obviously have an attachment to the organization. I mean, I think it's very hard to get a new donor to step up and, and do that because uh, they, don't, they wouldn't have the uh, maturity of relationship with the organization. But I, I, th I think that's part of the journey that uh, organizations can take their uh, supporters on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I absolutely. I, because, I mean, the appeal to the donor is you come inside the tent. You know, uh, you, you, it's a way of inviting you inside, as it were. Uh, you develop an intimacy with the organization by mm -hmm. approaching it that way. And therefore, you get a lot more out of it, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I would encourage that. I would also encourage uh, organizations to, to uh, take mature donors and ask them for relatively large one-off gifts as matching gifts you know, to leverage other people to give. I think uh, that's a, a, another really good way of taking a committed few and getting the impact of that committed few uh, to be much broader. Because a lot of people who are new donors like the idea of if I give a dollar, uh, someone else is going to match that dollar. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's a, it's a bigger bang for the buck, just put mm. bluntly. And, and so I think, I, I, think, I think the key is not looking at every donor as the same. Uh, it's segmenting the support base that you have and figuring out you know, where the growth potential is and where the leverage potential is. Great, thank you. I, we, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think, I think board members and past board members are a great place to start if yes. you're looking for major donors to fund operating costs. I mean, that's what we've done with me coming into Philanthropy Australia. And as Raymond said, you know, they're in the inner sanctum. They know the organisation so well, they, they know that need. And even if there's not high capacity donors on the board, you could pool the, the board's donations or even some past donors to, to fund the creation of a position or some other operating costs. And um, you know, one great thing about funding a development role or the creation of a development role is that the donor's off the hook after one or two years because mm -hmm. it, it should become self-funding. It's a great um, way to get major donors funding if they haven't funded before in operating costs to to fund those sort of roles because they can exit. And that's what donor, that's what major donors love, is that they're not, yeah. you know, they don't have to be there long, long, long term. Mm, that's a fantastic idea. I, I, I think it's be interesting too to see what people here think about the responsibility of directors of nonprofits to give. I mean, certainly in the US, it's an assumed thing that if you join a board, your responsibility is to either give or get. I mean, I, I remember I was on the board of a college in Chicago that actually had two students on the board and everybody's responsibility was to give or get $10,000. You couldn't be on the board if you didn't have that. Mm. And those two students did a hell of a lot more than $10,000 <laughs> because they thought about how can they get their $10,000? And they came up with all kinds of creative things. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yes. but, but I don't think that is the common expectation no. No. of people on nonprofit boards in Australia. No, and, yeah. and that might be a place to start. And you don't just want people on your board who can give it. No. I mean. You, you, that's not the reason to be on a board, on a board of a nonprofit, but if they also see that it's the give or get, or give and get, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing the creativity that you can engage uh, from your board in fundraising. Mm. Now we've got a question over here, and then we had lots and of hands over up there. over here, Hamilton. So we'll just go here and then we'll shoot across there. Uh, Sam Tolley from the Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation. My question is about uh, the status of um, uh, the not-for-profit sector. Um, I'm pleased to say we recently uh, had a meeting of uh, CEOs of charities in an informal way and it was a, a very collaborative experience and we, we discussed some of the issues that we thought were 
uh, primary in, in the state of South Australia in the charity sector. And one of them that rose to the top was um, the importance of getting the right people into the not-for-profit sector to be able to conduct the business as well as we possibly can. And one of the barriers that we see to that is when we talk about um, government sector, uh, corporate sector, and then not-for-profit, it seems to have a second-class connotation from a career perspective. Mm. And, and I, I think we, you know, we struggle with the name itself, um, and we struggle with uh, attracting people on the basis that they can come into this sector and uh, succeed in it, and then actually come back into a corporate if they so choose, without having a, uh, ooh, um, you've been in the not-for-profit sector sort of thing. Mm. And uh, so I, I'm interested if you have a view on uh, how we might address that as a, um, as a sector. Mm. Raymond's dying, right. dying to get in. No, no, I was thinking Simon. Simon. Oh, Simon, yeah. Simon. yeah. Yeah, I think we're all writing things down. <laughs> well, let me say a couple of things, but I know that you've struck a rich vein here, Sam. Um, look, firstly, I think one of the many, many cultural deficiencies in Australia is uh, one you've just touched on, namely that, uh, you know, relative to some other countries, particularly, you know, a big one over the Pacific, we struggle as a community feeling relaxed about transferring from one sector to another to another. I mean, I have to say, um, oh, well, I'll say something. <laughs> Controversially, you know, as chairman of SIRO, one of the hardest things I have is to engage with the federal government to have that has so many wonderfully gifted, long-term serving bureaucrats, no issue about that, but not enough of the rest of society in there. And all I'm saying is that um, we don't um, transfer across enough mm -hmm. from one sector to another to yes. another. And one or two other countries do it better than us. I think it's cultural. You know, what's the solution to that? I think that, again, um, uh, we need to be better at having that um, national conversation about what you get from being in each sector. Uh, you know, the, um, the captains of industry and the, the corporate sector get paid very well, absolutely. People in government don't get paid too badly and the non-for-profit, you know, pick up the, the pieces, so to speak. And all I would say is, yep, that's on the monetary side, that's on the remuneration. But there are other things that one get from... Um, uh, from being in a vocation, from, from actually spending time in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We don't emphasise that terribly much anymore. Um, a very long, hard road is, the one that is, is what we're really talking about here. To change a, a, a nation's culture is typically not something that happens overnight. Um, you know, my response is actually to, to look at other nations that have actually got into a better place than we have. and. Um, and, and I think it actually starts by, you know, all of us uh, being pretty honest about what one gets from being in a position and having that broad view as to what we want to get out of, out of life. Mm -hmm. That's a whole lot of woolly stuff there, I know, but you've actually struck a very, very important issue, mm -hmm. which I think as a nation holds us back a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully really? said. I mean, I, I think um, it, it's, a, it's a really valid point. Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to be mm, a recipient of a secondment, see, from, mm. from Allens. And I, you know, I was in my mid-20s, so I was young and I probably wasn't paid so much, so it didn't cost them that much. But I, was, I went on secondment to the Olympics and Allens paid my salary as a gift or a donation mm. for about five years. And, of course, I never went back and it changed <laughs> my life. Um, but I, I think, you know, we could be a bit more creative about some of this stuff as well. Like, there's no, definitely not enough secondments that mm. happen from the business world or government into the non-profit sector. Mm. And they can be very short term. They could be a very short term project for six months, um, let alone you know, something like I did, which is much more long term. Mm. So I think the other thing is that if it's going to happen, it's, it's more of a chance that it's going to happen successfully when, when people are younger. Mm. Because the older you get, the more confronting it is to actually make that shift from um, the the, the for-profit to the non-profit sector. But, um, but, you know, there's other ways as well. I mean, I know at PwC, the professional service firm now, they actually have a, um, a formal board placement program. Mm -hmm. So if you're on staff now, they're now pushing more staff to be on non-profit boards. So it's yeah. not necessarily about, you know, being employed, but, you yeah. know, they, as a result of that, who knows, they may go on to discover the joy of, you know, working in the non-profit sector. But... I think, you know, the problem here in Australia is that it's not seen as a privilege yeah. um, to be on a non-profit board mm. like it is in somewhere like North America, mm. uh, nor to be working 
you know, in the non-profit sector. I mean, so many people say to me, oh, is that a part-time job? Mm. Mm. Uh, and, you know, of course, the, the salaries and the packages are not nearly as strong as what they should be. It, it is changing in some, in some yeah. parts of the non-profit sector, the community sector, but we've got a hell of a long way to we go. We do, we yeah. do indeed. All right, we've got a couple of minutes and lots of questions. So, um, over here. It's Neil. Um, I'm just curious, what role do the recipients of the charity play in what charities have to offer? Um, you know, I, I'm sometimes seen as being, you know, the charity model that I am a person with a disability and therefore I have all these attitudes that are put on me. Um, what future do you see, what vision do you have for the future of charity? Well, well I'll have a quick go. Um, thanks for pointing out that we probably haven't spent a lot of time, you know, in the last hour. Certainly I didn't spend much time when I was talking about uh, the importance of, um, and, and if I'm not on point, just shout at me, but you know, the importance of, um, of having that two-way communication, particularly with those who are being helped. I haven't got the language right here because everyone's helping everyone else. You know, the giver, of course, it's my main theme, is getting helped in all sorts of ways. But uh, for example, you know, I do sit on the board of Big Issue and it is wonderful mm. seeing these homeless people um, you know, selling their magazines on street corners. But for me, what's more important than that? You know, they get half the revenue from a $5 magazine, whatever it is, and it's a, a real little business they run, et cetera, et cetera. But, but by far, the more poignant thing to me is when they're having a conversation to some bloke like me in a suit. I mean, I've sometimes stopped and just watched this. I mean, I feel like a bit of a fly on the wall. But it's extraordinary. You know, two different people from entirely different parts of society having a conversation. It might only be brief, but it's, it's, it's I think, um, something that we need to extol more and more and more and more. And again, I'm going back to my old point. It's not what it's done to the, the person sitting on the upturned milk crate selling the magazines. I mean, they feel accepted and all the sorts of stuff that has probably brought them to the place they're in anyway. They've been rejected all the way along. But again, it's the, um, the effect on the, the so-called you know, successful person in a suit having a touch of having a conversation that they ordinarily wouldn't have. It is all two-way. And to the extent that I probably underdid the, um, the important role that uh, the, the recipient of the money, if you like, has to play in that relationship, then you know, I apologise. But it's absolutely vital. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for one very quick question. We'll have to be quick and quick responses as well. Thank you. My name is Abra Patacharji. I work at Scotch College, an independent school in the southern suburbs. Um, one observation and one question. One of the first things is when we're talking about changing culture, um, it takes time, but schools have a great role to play in that. And the fact remains that there's many parents around here, there's many people involved in schools, have that expectation of the school that you send your child to or you're associated with because that's probably the most powerful way of actually changing culture. But the question that I have is, is in my mind, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Um, and it's kind of building off of Simon's comments as well as Alison's, which is, you know, we've talked about how there's, um, there's not many saints around. Uh, there are a few and we appreciate them. And there's also the understanding that those that have great resources usually minimize their, their tax liability as much as possible. And I'm just you know, curious about whether any of you, especially those of you up on the dais, face the tyranny of the DGR and the whole idea that actually there's so lim there's tax deductibility is so focused and so limited, preventing a change in culture. Mm, I think that's Louise. Yeah, I'm, to I'm happy to talk to that. I mean, you've hit on a raw nerve there because mm -hmm. there's no question in Australia that the whole DGR, the tax deductibility, um, issue is a problem because it is difficult to get. Um, you know, again, I, I hate making too many comparisons with North, North America, but you, you just do in this sort of business that it is much, much easier for a community organisation, non-profit charity, whatever you want to call it, to get that status in North America. I mean, they're staggered at how difficult it is to get in Australia. Um, 
We're a classic example. I mean, Philanthropy Australia is a non-profit. We've been around for 40 years, and last year only we got tax deductible status <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. And I think it's we crazy. had tried four times, and we ended up having to get a special listing. And, and as you can imagine, we had some pretty interesting people <laughs> to lobby and legal advice and everything else. But you know, my sister organisations around the world just no. shook their head and said, "This is unbelievable." Um, but it is difficult to get. I mean, the interesting thing is that the Prime Minister will shortly be announcing the re-establishment of what's called the Community Business Partnership. And John Howard had a similar group of community leaders and business leaders and philanthropists when he was uh, Prime Minister, looking at ideas to stimulate and grow philanthropy. And um, there's no question it's on our hit list yeah. for that group when they get uh, set up, because we are um, sick and tired of how difficult mm, mm. it is to get, particularly for certain pockets of the non-profit sector. Interestingly enough, I've spent a lot of my career in the arts sector, and it's relatively easy in that sector compared to some other parts yeah. of the non-profit sure, sector. Absolutely. So yeah. we definitely need to do something about it. Thank you. I'm glad to Sorry, hear that. I've got a really on the important point on okay. this. <laughs> Sorry, this is a. I mean, we all know though that so much of Australia's private wealth is built in discretionary family trusts. And the fact is that they need to distribute all of their accessible income every year. And uh, there's no, re I don't know why as a nation we don't talk more about those, en that enormous aggregate of wealth um, being distributed to non-DGR trusts. Because provided that there's the mm. charitable purpose that they're allowed to distribute to, the charity doesn't require DGR status. And there are many terrific charities, and up until recently Philanthropy Australia was one, which doesn't, for unusual reasons, not have DGR status. But I think we just need to connect that enormous pot, which is distributing income every year, mm. to, um, to, to, to that non-DGR area. Great point. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, on that point, we have to end. And we ha now have Jeff Day, who is the chairman of Impact 100, to say the vote of thanks. Welcome to Thank you, much. Jeff. <laughs>